love makes a family. Was that the name of a campaign or something? Yes. Saying, hey, love makes a family. Love is all, right? <laughs> love is all we need. I wish. Please be advised that this episode of Caution includes descriptions and mentions of childhood emotional trauma, codependency and family dynamics, generational trauma, household conflict, emotional manipulation and loving relationships, avoiding accountability, unspoken expectations, domestic violence, grooming behavior, childhood sexual abuse, silent treatment, and self-compassion. We highly encourage our audience to review our trigger guide for self-care at healtoend.org slash caution. Like a lot of Eastern families, the way families here say, I love you, it's not really that kind of a dynamic. It would be really weird to say that. It's like, that's the thing lovers say to each other, not a parent to a child or a child to a parent. But there are other ways that love is embedded in the dynamic. In my family, love is cutting food for someone and bringing it to them. Love is a lot of physical caretaking and zero emotional. <laughs> Okay, maybe one person, but extremely inconsistent. I grew up with a family not atypical of codependent parents who did the thing. They got married, they had children, and they continued in their codependent life with a lot of conflict, a lot of disagreement, lack of relational skills, lack of capacity or support to do any healing around their generational traumas or support for mental health, you know, your typical shit. There was a lot of conflict all the time in my house and parents would be arguing over petty shit, big stuff, small stuff, and doing silent treatment, not talking to each other. And I always growing up had this question, why the fuck are you together? Why won't you just separate? And then I would express that a lot of the times the answer to that was, well, because of you children, we would never do that to you. We would just put you through the misery of now as opposed to you know, separate. God forbid. Divorce was still quite taboo. It was not an easy thing. It was not a common thing as it is today. This one time, another round of these arguments had happened. My parents were in silent treatment. Me and my brother in the middle kind of being played whose side we're on, communicating in between them, trying to get our shit done when parents aren't talking. All the toxic shit. And I was having a moment alone with my father in the car. And I just was like, you two really really seem like you don't like each other, you don't get along, you can't agree on anything, you just act like you don't like each other. Why wouldn't you just get a divorce, please? And my father took a long pause. And for the first time that I'd ever heard either of my parents express this verbally, he said, because I love your mother. And that was the end of the conversation. I remember being so awestruck by even hearing that because it was so clear to me that from the behavior, from everything they had modeled, there was no love present in that dynamic. So when I heard my father say, despite all of that, everything I had witnessed, he loves her. It left me with a lot to think about. <laughs> what is love? What does it mean? Why is this happening? Because he loves her. So they're just going to keep doing this. This is just not ending. And it took me a long time to accept that because of the codependent dynamic, they're never going to separate. But they are here to stay. They cannot function without the other one's dysfunction. I had the same conversation with my family over and over, especially with my mom. It's like, why don't you just leave him? Can we just end this misery? And it was always about the children. I conflated this idea of love with suffering. Like when you love someone, the way you show that you love is that you suffer and you show them by any means necessary how much you care about them. I remember when someone asked me, how did I know that I was in love with the father of my daughter, who is now an adult now, and this is as a teenager. They were like, how do you know you love this person? And I still remember my answer. My answer was, I know I love him because I've never taken so much shit from someone in my life. 
my mother, we've had some friction, to say the least, about my survivorship and not sharing with the family and disassociating from my survivor story. And we've just been like, mom, I want to connect with you. I want to get to know you. I want to know who you are. I want to know what your trauma is. I want to know what happened to you when you were a child. I want to understand you better. I really want to have more compassion for you. And I want you to know me. And every time we hit up on that conversation, if you want to call it this, about how much I desire for this connection, she goes to this quote, a mother's love is never ending. It withstands. And she would just say that. El amor de una madre es para siempre. And she would say that to like, basically, that's it. Gavel hit, end of the story, we're moving on. And she has said that to me several times. And I'm like at the point where I wonder, what does that mean to her? What does it mean to her to tell me that a mother's love for her daughter is never ending? But in fact, I am standing in front of her, begging her to talk to me, to let me in, to tell me a story, to cry together, something. And all she could give me back is, I love you. And that is forever. So keep that. And I don't get it. It makes me angry. And I don't know her story, her journey. It could be something I don't understand, but I won't understand it. I'll never understand it because we're here in love. So basically throw everything else out because God damn it, a mother's love, that is the ultimate, ultimate love. And you have it forever. So be happy. Growing up, were you confused about the meaning of love because of how your family expressed it? Earlier I said, in our family, we don't say I love you. Actually, I take that back. The only times my mother has reminded me that she loves me is when she's trying to emotionally manipulate me. If you love me, you do this and that. And how could you do this to me? I have loved you so much, or I love you so much. When I look at what I thought love was, literally my first romantic relationship, which was the most abusive relationship I was in, it was a replication of every fucking toxic dynamic ever. And I would look at that so many times and think to myself, we've been through so much shit together. This is love. This must be love. While at the same time knowing, I hate this person so much. They make me so miserable. But also that would play into a narrative of not love as in I feel warm and fuzzy inside, but love as in this is now connection. We have been through so much together and there's so many intensity around my emotions for this person that this is the connection that must be called love. When children play, when boys harass girls, or even when girls harass boys, we look at it all, oh, how cute. She loves you. He loves you. And I'm like, are we so fucking incapable of expressing love without hurting each other? Is it so difficult to actually express love? What has happened to us that as a society, we are okay with expressions of love that are violent and harmful and even hurtful? I just saw a show the other day too about a kid talking to an adult saying, well, if she pulls your hair, that means she likes you. She talked about punching this boy that she liked. And it's not that they're expressing that, but it is a wonderful opportunity right there for when somebody says they hit me and I know they like me, great opportunity to have a conversation. Why do you think somebody hitting you means that they like you? Just ask questions. And it's not the time to say, no, that's wrong. That's not what people do. Because again, that's you telling somebody something. It's not them coming to that conclusion on their own with the information that you are giving them. Why is that? Did you see that before? That's a wonderful way to dig through that and say, no, actually, that's not how people should show their love. That is how someone has a feeling and doesn't know how to express that feeling and uses physical force to express it. The secret of parenting is not in what a parent does, but rather who the parent is to a child. When a child seeks contact and closeness with us, we become empowered as a nurturer, a comforter, a guide, a model, a teacher, or a coach. For a child well attached to us, we are her home base from which to venture into the world, her retreat to fall back to, her fountainhead of inspiration. 
All the parenting skills in the world cannot compensate for a lack of attachment relationship. All the love in the world cannot get through without the psychological umbilical cord created by the child's attachment. I think we are so starved for love that we perceive any attention, including negative attention, as love. To get hit by someone means they pay attention to you. And they pay attention to you in an intense way. And we are just so starved for that attention and that care to be seen at all. Right. That we don't care if it's negative or positive. We still feel like that is part of what loving behavior is. In fact, the truth is so much of what we call loving behavior is negative attention. When we talk about love, I think that sometimes people don't actually truly understand that love is an emotion. It's an emotion just like any other emotion. And those other emotions, we are much more keen on understanding that things change. We understand that emotions come and go. When it comes to love, it is one of the emotions that we are adamant that it is in and of itself sustainable. That the very idea of those four letter words coming out of somebody's mouth, the very idea that somebody proclaims it or just feels it in that moment is strong enough to sustain a lifetime. And that's where we have a problem because I think love is beautiful too, but I believe that love is fluid, is situational. If we're doing it in an intentional way, we're interacting with it. If I say to you, a red bee, I love you. You're my friend. I love you. That doesn't mean that two years from now, that's not going to change. It could change that I could love you more, or mm -hmm. it could change like, you know, our relationship has shifted and I don't know how I feel anymore. And that's not a bad thing, but we see that as a bad thing. It's like, oh shit, I don't love that person anymore. Something is wrong. I didn't choose right. I didn't do this or whatever the case may be. It's such a natural process mm -hmm. to be highly in love and then be like totally neutral. Be like, I think I'm falling out of love. Maybe get back into love, leave it, come back. That is so natural, but we make it unnatural. And we want the very idea of love to be this magical, sustainable thing which it is not. It is us that make it. We create it and make it and sustain it, but we don't have the skill. It all comes back to what is the skill of loving? Mm -hmm. And then breaking that down. When we say love, what do we actually mean? I ask myself now, when I say that to people, when I say, I love you, I'm like, what am I saying? I'm actually sharing my emotion. I'm sharing how I feel about somebody else, which doesn't mean that person has to do a fucking thing. They're just receiving information. But usually when we proclaim love to someone else, that means that that person must do something, either respond verbally or do something physically. Yeah, it's an expectation put upon you. I feel like love has become a sad excuse for not actually wanting to do so much of the work of relationship building. Instead of saying or doing the work of relationship building, communicating, being truthful, being vulnerable, being honest, actually knowing how you feel, having done the work of what is going on inside me, like what does it mean when I say I love you? Instead of any of that, we just say I love you and the conversation ends. Because love is essentially a subjective feeling. We all feel it differently. It's not a universal concept where everybody has a similar understanding of what it is and what it means and what the expectations that come with it are. We act as if it is universal, but it yes. isn't. But we understand love as this magical, mystical mystery of universe. If this thing that's unexplainable and unknowable, and I think what it really is, the thing that makes it so unknowable and magical is our complete lack of capacity, the fear that we have from doing the work that it actually takes to have a loving relationship. That's the unknowable mystery <laughs> that we don't want to get near. So we replace all of that work with I love you. I love you so we should have children together. I love you so we should make a family together. I love you so we should move in together. I love you so after I hurt you, you should forgive me. A 2014 study among college students revealed that the phrase I love you indicates a range of direct and indirect meanings. From giving advice, as in the meaning of take care, apology, as in the meaning of I apologize for what I have done, compliment, as in the meaning of you're great, request, as in the meaning of I need your help, invitation, as in the meaning of I want to have sex with you, farewell, as in the meaning of bye, 
and gratitude as in the meaning of thanks for helping me out. When people tell me I love you and I was like, why do you love me? We have this magical feeling or idea, ideology about love. We take that as truth. And in that moment, it could be truth. Like I feel this loving energy and it doesn't actually have to mean you're in love. The feeling of it isn't the problem. It is that thinking that just because you feel it in one moment, now it is. You don't have to interact with it anymore. I love you. And there's no questioning my love. Another thing that love gets conflated with, we take that moment of warm and fuzzy feeling about someone that we feel inside of us, and we use it to justify so many other things or to forego having so many other conversations. I think what people actually want and mean when they want love, they seek love in any relationship, is that they want a consistent enough pattern of care and attention in the relationship. So like, my mother loves me a lot, apparently, and she always has. And she's always done a lot of things. She sacrificed herself quite a bit. She has censored her children as the only thing that matters ever to her in her life. We can talk a lot about the society that has failed my mother and so many mothers like her to reach a place like that. She does a lot of things for us that she thinks is the clear indication of her love for us. I have not received that love. I have received physical love. I have received a lot of care around my physical needs, a lot of attention to my physical needs. Physical and emotional are not completely separate from each other. But because it's about her love for me and what she does for me is coming from her love and not attention to my needs and care for what I actually am telling her I need. I have always been left starved for the kind of love that I can receive that is available to me. I've never felt seen. I've never felt like she knows who I am, what my needs are, what my feelings are. What do I care about in life? Mothers in this society are put up on a pedestal. Mother is the hardest thing in the world to do. It's a beautiful gift to be a mother, like all of these things. And yes, those things can be true. But living within this fucking fucked up system, the ways in which we uplift mothers in that way also creates an environment that doesn't allow mothers to fail. They have to be this perfect entity. And then as children, we love our mothers by being good, making sure that we don't hurt them. It's not actually reciprocal. In my experience, loving mm -hmm. my mother meant making sure that my mother did not suffer, did not hurt, that we were good that everything we did was good so that she can have a good life. When I think about love or the ways in which parents love children in terms of how they rear them, because we often say, I'm doing this because I love you. I often see that there is a clear similarity in the tactics that parents use in the same ways that harm doers in domestic violence, intimate partner violence relationships, and also the things that they use like carceral responses. I say, go to your room, that's isolation, keeping them away from other kids, going to bed without dinner, making sure that nobody leaves the room until somebody fesses up. If one kid does something wrong, everybody's getting in trouble. It's about mm -hmm. surveillance because we're teaching our kids to surveil each other. We're using carceral responses and saying it's about love because we're saying we're protecting them from the world or showing them what could happen. And rather than wrapping it up in emotion and saying, I know what I'm doing for you, a concept would be like actually talking about the things and giving information and really digging into these things rather than I am a protector as your parent. I care and love you. And this is my job. So don't question it. I love you. So when I say do this, you do it. Now, harm doer, I love you. I do this because I love you. We keep using the same language. And although we might not feel like we're thinking the same things, it is a cycle that continues. And then love is this, this magical thing we don't question. And I want to question love. All of that is what we have come to call loveism. Loveism is a cultural system of expressions and behaviors that extends love beyond the subjective feeling that it is and encourages using love as a tool for control, manipulation, and oppression. It is the partner who is abusive and instead of giving an apology says, but you know I love you. 
It is the parent who abandons their child or is neglectful and instead of actually growing and doing better, tries to justify it with, well, it's a given. The bond is love and I love you. And that's the end of the conversation. Love has become burdened. The subjective feeling that is so beautiful. That is, in fact, if we focus on the feeling itself, it is truly transformative and powerful. And I think this is something that people really want. Every culture has its own rich history and culture and literature around love, this concept of love. So it must be something so magical and powerful beyond anything else. As humans, we figured this much out, yet we have burdened love with every possible bullshit we could come up with. We have burdened love with all of our shortcomings. The reason we call it a system, I think, is because this isn't to criticize individuals. We can only do what we have learned. And what we have learned, like I had learned, like we have learned, is what we've been told by generations of what love is and how it functions and how our parents and our lovers have showed us it is, how movies show us what love and romance is. It is completely skewed. It is just such a disservice and such a distraction from what love, as in the subjective feeling, can be for us and what it can do for us. Schools for love do not exist. Everyone assumes that we will know how to love instinctively, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. We still accept that the family is the primary school for love. Those of us who do not learn how to love among family are expected to experience love in romantic relationships. However, this love often eludes us. For me, everything I knew about love was really an abstraction until my dog Dexter crossed over. And then I understood love. Now I understand love really in its most powerful format, comes out of grief. It is only then when you really get to access, in my experience, if you open yourself up to that experience of what love really is and how it lives on, it becomes that is spiritual, becomes that bigger than anything concept and becomes something to be so deeply grateful for, that you have loved so deeply that now grief is taking you down and making you feel and making you feel alive and dead at the same time. As a parent, how does love show up for me? How do I love my daughter? And I just shifted. I wanted to get pregnant because I was so lonely and I wanted to love somebody. I wanted to fucking have the ability to love somebody the way that I wish that I was loved. And that is totally not the best reason to have a child, but that was my reason. I wanted to have that child. And so I think a lot of us have children, make families for reasons that were created for us or out of oppression or out of many things. And it continues the cycle because we never get to the point of even knowing that there is a conversation to be had about love and emotions. It's yeah. just a given. It is given to you. And then you go from there. The way I started cultivating a connectedness with my daughter was around, it's you and me against the world. It's always me and you. So developing this thing that is just us together. And of course, in retrospect, that's not a healthy dynamic. That was the beginning of probably starting codependency with her. And of course, for me, it was just letting her know, I got you for anything. I love you. And I'm going to show you how much I love you, right? And of course, in that, almost like trying to correct my wrongs, because this is another reason why people have children, is really, it's all about me righting that wrong. It's all about me trying to figure out love. It has nothing to do with her. Of course, I love her. But this act of loving is not about her. I think that I am truly loving my daughter probably better or for the first time as an adult because she knows who she is. When she's a child growing up, she's putty. She's a lot of things. She's learning. She's making mistakes. I'm giving her a lot of stuff. She's got to sift through it. She's got to make her mistakes fall, do whatever the hell. And now I can really start thinking and looking at my daughter and being like, who is she? Because even though I raised my child, I don't know who she is, really. So now we're talking and communicating and she's filling in the gaps of the things that I didn't know. I had no idea about. 
And I'm really getting to know who she is as a person now, outside of me. I have nothing to do with it. And that was a big piece for me because we are taught children are a piece of us. They represent us, all of this stuff, the shame factor and all that. And I remember getting to a place where I was just like, my daughter is her own person. And it doesn't matter if she makes a mistake. To me, it's about learning how to let go, really about understanding that to love her is to accept the fact that she has my DNA, but she does not have to do anything that resembles my life. She could be absolutely the complete opposite of who I am. And that should not mean anything. Love must liberate and not limit. Mm. It's the idea that we think of love as attachment. And I actually think love is about non-attachment. True love is about being not attached to the outcome of who you want this person to become, to be, to act. If you truly love someone, that means you are prepared to observe them, to be there, to just watch them and show up for them consistently, give them care and attention that is available to them in order for them to become who they want to be. It does not come with expectations. Love doesn't have to be reciprocal. This is complicated because we all love under capitalism. We all build relationships and create families under the notion that our survival depends on this loving relationships that we have. It gets very messy. It is confusing. It is scary. It is very complicated when you actually look at it. But also in a way, there's so much power in being able to be present with the idea of love so that you can be not attached to love, not attached to the people you love on an emotional level and separate that from your expectations. If you want them to act differently towards you, just tell them. Tell them what your boundaries are. Hold them accountable. You can do that whether or not you love someone. I think it's easier. It's easier to say, I love you. Everything is said. It's not, let's get into a process. Let's do this. Let's do that. It's like the band-aid, this quick understanding, but not really an understanding. To me, love makes a family. I would say love makes a person. It's about you. It's creating who you are and your capacity for yourself. I think we don't start with us. We start right in the middle of it, like, bam, you're a product of this. You're part of this unit. And this is what love is. And this is who you listen to and listen to us and we'll take care of you. And of course we get it. We live in a system where shit is fast, fast, fast. People have two and three jobs. Things are fucking rough. This is not easy. That it's so much easier to do that. Just listen to me and don't get hurt. And in the long run, when we're talking about sustainability, when we're talking about Years and years from now, when we're talking about that child being an adult, being in a relationship, then we're thinking about how that pattern just persists. Love makes a family, but also love makes murder, makes rape, and makes child sexual abuse. Because 90% of the people who murder, who rape, and who molest our children are our family, are people we know, people in the neighborhood, the people that we interact with every fucking day. So let's rethink this when we're thinking about this thing called love. It's this thing about love. Let's put us all over here and everybody else over there. When abuse happens with a stranger, that is a whole set of different tactics that need to be addressed. But in other cases, we know the person. We know exactly where they are, who they are. Then how do we justify love? in this context. CSA prevention is 100% about family. So what makes the family, especially what makes the family in which CSA and other forms of childhood trauma, emotional, physical, sexual, does not happen? Because that's where the cycle is broken. If a child has one loving, caring, consistent adult in their life growing up, the trajectory of their life is radically different. Even if they were subject to many traumatic events. That is something we know. That's been research. We know that even one single actually caring, loving adult in a child's life can make that big a difference. Mm -hmm. So knowing this, when we limit the access of a child to few adults, oftentimes it's one or two, maybe three, if there's a grandparent involved. In this context we're talking about, we are increasing the chances 
that this child has access to no available adults who can provide the appropriate love and care that the child needs to actually grow up in a proper way. According to a 2021 study of over 7,500 households, children who had constant access to always available trusted adults, as well as different sources of both parental and non-parental adult support, were significantly more resilient and had better outcomes in the face of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And what actually, I believe, protected so many children for so long was to not give that power and control to a few adults, just one, two, three, whatever, to have complete say and power over the child. And that has not been the case for a lot of the history, for many cultures, for many tribes. Families used to be not the nuclear family. Families would be the entire extended family and the neighbors and the town. The child would have had access to so many adults in their lives. And if their primary caregivers, if the people who gave them birth or raised them or biologically related to them, for any reason, were not able to give them what they needed, then there would be more chance that there would be somebody else who could step up and play that role. Two people may be the vehicles for creating the physical body, but that human is now the responsibility of the entire community to do well. And we give disproportionate power to those humans whose bodies were the vehicle to do everything. Our limitations for what they cannot do, a threshold is so fucking high. They can do so much before somebody steps in and be like, this is fucked up. You shouldn't do it. And we even justify that with love because we have an idea that there is something magical about creating a child, biological child especially, that transforms you and changes you and no longer you are the person you were before. I wish that were true and use love as a justification for that, that now you qualify to take care of the entire well-being of this new human that's here because we trust that you love them. Mm -hmm. And because you love them, we trust that you'd be the best person qualified for this job. So until we think like that, then what makes a family? I am literally in this practice right now that I've been in since Corona hit of trying to figure out how I love myself. What is love? I constantly have this negative self-talk to myself when I fuck up. It's like, you fucked up. I beat myself up so much. Not that I don't love myself. I believe I do love myself, but I could be loving myself a hell of a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote down a list of things. What are the ways in which I am not loving myself? And that was fucking hard, really thinking about how I don't love myself. And a lot of the ways I don't love myself has to do with the love of other people superseding mine. Because in order to receive love, you have to love hard and give somebody everything and take the bullshit and then wait for the response. And that's what I've been doing for the longest time. And then when I don't get it, it's like, but why? I was so good. I was following that same fucking pattern, which doesn't work. Who am I outside of this system? Everything that I've been taught, what does it mean to truly love myself? And what things do I do or say that counteracts that? I started using the term self-acceptance or self-compassion. I don't think I understood how to show up in a loving way for others, really, until I started to show up for myself. And it's ongoing work. There have been times in my life where I've been very good and consistent with that. There are other times when I am not able to do that. But now self-love and self-acceptance and compassion have become mostly synonymous for me. I have been able to create my own meaning for what it means, how it feels, and what it actually looks like when I love myself. I have been on a Whitney Houston kick. I've been listening to Whitney Houston nonstop. I saw the documentary and thinking about her as a fellow survivor in the world. I'm listening to her music and rocking out to it. And I was listening to one of my favorite songs of hers. And it was one of the songs that I sung on my sixth grade graduation. And it's the greatest love of all. I remember being in my kitchen, listening to the song, listening to the words. And then I started crying. I just started bawling. Because for me, my interpretation of the song is this is her CSA song. If you listen to the words, I believe the children are our future. Treat them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty that they possess inside. 
give them a sense of pride. Let the children's laughter remind us how we used to be. Everybody's searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I've never found anyone who fulfilled my needs, a lonely place to be. And it keeps on going. And basically she's talking about what she came to is that she has to love herself. The greatest love of all is loving herself. Thank you.